All right, next segment of the show here, welcoming in Clinton Fowler. It's time for Fowler's Facts. There's so many resources now in the sport. Also want to give a shout out. Saw Ryan Villapoto on hand this weekend. Also, he's got the Title 24 podcast with Dean and Ricky Carmichael. So, so many different ways to break this down. We'll use the numbers here, Clinton. First, we want to talk about Jet Lawrence and uh, finally, finally getting that Triple Crown win. But to me, this wasn't that big a deal. We already knew Jet was the best guy. To me, at some point, it was bound to happen, and it finally did. Yep, he finally broke the curse, Weege. Pretty impressive ride. You know, the thing that really stood out to me when I dove into the numbers, he was fastest in 19 of 33 laps. So not only did he break the curse, but he did it in a pretty dominating fashion in Glendale. That got me thinking, how many laps has he been fastest in the whole season? Guys, 80 of 130 total laps he's been fastest. So 62% of the time, he has been fastest on the track. Daniel, it, it kind of highlights he's ready for that big bike. Well, it tells me a couple of things. Number one, obviously, speed is not an issue. But it makes me think about actually the way he's been racing at times because we've seen him, Jason, kind of go into this management mode where we feel like he's just kind of watching the field, doing his thing. So to hear that number, it's impressive. But, Jason, I kind of think it could be maybe even worse if he wanted to be. Yeah, I think and it could like, be higher than 62. I just yeah. don't think he plays it that way. Yeah. Exactly. And then to Clinton's point, is he ready for the big bike? I see his frustration when he wins. Ricky talked about that. That's a pure sign that he's ready to move on. And it is. This class to him is, is no longer a testing ground. He's just getting through it. He's ready for that next chapter. That's clear to see. Okay, so he has speed on a 450 for sure. And another rider who definitely does, I feel like we talk about this every week, is the Justin Barsha resurgence here. And here's what I noticed from the floor. He is matching Eli Tomac in that final race of the year. These two guys have raced each other. I'm going to just, this is not your numbers. These are mine. A billion times, I think, since they were probably <laughs> nine years old. And look, Barsha has always been good. But Eli Tomac is second all time in Supercross wins. The amount of nights where Justin Barsha's speed can match Eli Tomac is pretty rare, but he's doing it this year. That was another really good run. Yeah, Weege, impressive night. Um, I love your billion stat. Um, I'll have exactly. to go back and verify that one. Okay. <laughs> um, but you know what? In Glendale, dude, he was fastest in two of three of those Triple Crown races. Two of three of the races, Barsha was fastest. In the first in the first triple crown race he was he set four of the top 10 laps finished third just behind tomac and webb not as good in the second he didn't get quite the start finished sixth in and then in the third race i mean two of the top 10 fastest laps as you said he just hung with eli the entire time pretty impressive speed guys here's another one two people have been in the top five since daytona Krupa Webb and Justin Barsha. Barsha could end up playing the X Factor here, Daniel. That would be terrible for Webb and Tomac if he did, because he's such a menace. He makes so much noise. When you're around him, you know it's him. And yeah, Jason, he's fired up. He, he He's caught up in whatever's going on right now uh, with this, this new Barsha. He's happy, he's playful, he's funny. And all of a sudden he is just shredding on everybody. So if you're in a title fight, Jason, do you want Justin Barsha around making all that noise? No? no? Well, it already happened. I mean, he already added another position between Tomac and Webb. And if you're Webb, you got to hope, well, maybe it'll work the other way around. And we've been teasing it all week. There's still Aaron Plessinger. There's still Jason Anderson. He did get up from that crash. I think he's okay. There's still Ken Roxon. And then there's still Chase Sexton. And who knows, man? We're looking normally at Sexton. He's a full race behind in points. I don't know. I tend to think that each weekend you're going to see bigger swings than we're used to in this championship, Clinton. I mean, you've seen the times. Any one of these guys can finish in between. Yeah, I mean, you look at it. Tomac's seven points up on Webb. That's the difference between first and fourth. Well, hey, we've just talked about Sexton. We've just talked about Barsha. You throw in Plessinger. You throw in Roxon, who had an incredible race at Indy. Seven points, maybe not that much. These guys are going to play a role from now till then, Clinton. Like you said, the, the point swing of seven, we could see that happen a couple more times before the end. Awesome. Great for the fans. Great for the fans. It is. All right, thanks for joining us, Clinton. We'll see you next week. Time to wrap up this episode of SMX Insider Championship rolling to Atlanta Motor Speedway. This is interesting. It's a day race, so adjust your clocks here, everybody. Race Day Live will start at 9.30 a.m. Good luck with the early rehearsal and show-up time there, Daniel. This is all to have a 3 o'clock 
window live on NBC, which is always huge for the sport. Hi folks, Lee Diffie from NBC Sports here. If you truly enjoyed what you just watched, you can get more news, interviews, and highlights by subscribing to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube page. You can get it all, so go for it.